Well, City Comptroller Scott Stringer apparently wants to prove that when it comes to convening town hall meetings, New York can hold its own with all those little villages in Vermont and New Hampshire. He's been holding these meetings all over the city, and tomorrow evening, Comptroller Stringer will be in our very own Flatbush. He's going to meet residents, hear their views on issues important to local community, and let them know how his office can help them address those issues. And joining us once again at the table is New York City Comptroller Scott Stringer. Welcome back to BK Live. Great sir. to be at Brick. Great. Well, we're happy to have you again, and we're happy to have you in Flatbush. Now, this is the only neighborhood that comes to mind where you can get a roti, matzo ball soup, everything authentically within 100 feet of each other. So all those people coming together, they've got some issues. It's great. You know, a few weeks ago, I met with stakeholders in the Flatbush community, council member Jamani Williams. Uh, we have a whole host of people from Kevin Parker's office, and the list is on and on, Nick Perry. And so it's a great opportunity, as it was a few weeks ago, to talk local community issues. and. Now we're going to Flatbush Big. We're going to open up. Uh, we're going to open up and invite hundreds of people to tell me what they want me to look at as controller, mm -hmm. also to voice their opinions, to talk about issues from the national stage to the most local street corner. And I love these town hall meetings because it's open mic. Mm -hmm. I don't invite people Completely to come. Unfiltered. I don't clean a list. This is yeah, totally yeah. unfiltered. You can come and talk and give us your lowdown on the community. Mm -hmm. And then my job is to respond to the local concerns and also make the case uh, on the things that I'm working on. Why Flatbush? Uh, because Flatbush is, as you said, the center of Brooklyn, uh, a community of great culture, great economy, uh, great people, folks who struggle every day to put food on the table, take care of their kids. Uh, it's a real working class community, but it's an aspirational community, and I'm really excited to be back in Flatbush. We've been doing these town hall meetings for years That's all true. over the city, and I get so much out of it, and I hope the people do as well. Now, I've had the opportunity to attend some of these things, and like you said, it's completely unfiltered. You take every question that comes oh, yeah. up, and people have concerns that are very specific, and some want to talk about things that are very broad as well. So I wondered, in your office, how do you guys churn all of that when people come with my street, my block, and they also want to talk about the president? Well, this is what's great about a controller town hall meeting, because it really is unfiltered. We don't call up and invite 100 people, 80 of them I know, where we can anticipate what the question is, because then that's not a real town hall meeting. And I've been doing these town hall meetings since I was a state legislator back in the day in Manhattan. So you're right. How do you plan for it? Well, that's a big question. At the end of the day, we try to plan for it, but I think all the people in the office, we kind of throw up our hands and say, well, let's see what happens. But when you come with a local problem or a problem that you're dealing with, mm -hmm. our office will definitely call you the next day. Satisfaction guaranteed. No matter how big or small your individual problem is, yeah. whether it's a food stamp issue, a housing issue, we take your concerns very seriously. And second, I want to have a conversation about the Trump tax plan. I want people to know that tax cuts for millionaires mm -hmm. uh, at the expense of single-headed households that are actually going to see a tax increase under the possible proposals by Donald Trump. I want to talk to people about the homeless crisis that we're facing in Brooklyn and around the city. I want to talk about the children, the babies that are in commercial hotels languishing. It's costing our city millions of dollars a year uh, to do this kind of work. And I just want to have that one-on-one -on -one discussion. I don't want people to think the controller is sitting in the municipal building across the street at City Hall with the door closed, the lights off, just looking at the numbers. I right. want to be able to relate it to the work that we're doing in the community. So you don't want people to think that because that's not what you do, but that's what the people of New York City, by and large, have been used to. Other controllers, you sort of couldn't pick them out in the police lineup, but cool. you've been very out front and vocal, and people seem to appreciate that. Why are you taking that stance when you could be the person who's doing the numbers, keeping everything in check? Because you got to take control, and you got to get out there, and you got to relate to the people's office. Uh, and make the case to folks. So, for example, we're the counterweight to City Hall. Uh, we advocate for the people in the city, but the only way you really can do it effectively is if you're talking to people. So after Hurricane Sandy, for example, mm -hmm. I didn't wait for people to come to our office. We actually went out and held hearings, if you remember. Right. Uh, you were out there uh, in all the communities, whether it was Coney Island or Staten Island, 
we had uh, our office out there listening to people. So when we did an audit about Sandy, mm -hmm. we were able to inform the public about what we found. That's true on homelessness. Right. That's true on the Trump proposed budget cuts to the city. We need to represent the working people of the city, the people who struggle every day. So yes, we're going to be in Flatbush. Then the next, uh, mm -hmm. then the next stop is going to be Park Slope a few weeks later, and we're going to continue to get out in Brooklyn and hear what this great diverse borough has to say to their elected officials. So just as you said, in your own words, you're the counterweight to City Hall. Sometimes. So when you are writing these reports and making recommendations, how effective is that sort of dance that you have to do if sometimes you haven't been afraid to be critical of City Hall, but you don't put that ahead of what the needs of the people are in advocating for them. It's a balance. You know, the charter says that the controller has to monitor city agencies, mm -hmm. root out waste and fraud. Sometimes that puts you in a, you know, a conflict with City Hall, but other times we're working very closely with City Hall. So there's a real balance day to day that the controller has to deal with. But that was envisioned by the city charter to have one office mm -hmm. that could really be a counterweight when necessary. But also, make no mistake, we work with the city when we go to Albany and talk about our four-year financial plan. We go to the uh, state regulators together. So there's a lot that we do. But at the end of the day, my job is to work, watch out for the people in our city, the people who are trying to raise families and trying to do the right thing. Yeah. And they need somebody who's got their back. And that's what this office has been all about. Well, you spoke a second ago about the city charter and how they envision your office would work. One thing that they might not have been able to envision is the fact that people are aging in place in Brooklyn. I have one figure from a report that you did that shows from 2005 to 2015, the number of New Yorkers over 65 surged by over 19 percent. So that's more than triple the rate of growth for the population over age 65. 19.2 percent. We yeah. are a city uh, that is getting older, and mm -hmm. I think that's good. People are living longer, and more importantly, the people who are aging in place also want to enjoy the city that they built. And make yeah. no mistake, a lot of our seniors today were the people who built up our housing and our schools and our daycare centers. And we want to make sure that people can have a full life as they get into those older years. So the report that we issued was basically to say to everybody, mm -hmm. we've got to figure this out. We have an aging population, but we also have some challenges with that. Uh, 40% of seniors are paid 30% of their income in rent. That's right. We have the Senior Citizen Rent Increase Exemption Program and a program for people with disabilities, a bill that I authored in the assembly. We need to make sure that people can automatically register to get the, the uh, benefit that they're entitled to. I want to see us work better with the real estate industry in making sure that technology mm -hmm. can be placed in apartments where people with disabilities live whether it's bars and bathtubs or other ways to make sure people don't fall right. and they can actually get medical care quicker in a more responsive way. So actually, this report was not to be critical. This was to say, hey, look, folks, here's the data. People yeah. are getting older. That's the good news. Now, let's create a city where people can lead a full life in their senior years. You know, I'm not that far away. I'm <laughs> happy to tell you I'm 56 years old. I have a five-year-old and three-year-old. And so, let me tell you, when it I run... stop the clock. When, when, <laughs> when, when I run around that park, I mean, this is my, this is my way of aging in place. Right. Uh, we want to... So I think about these issues, and I want to make sure that everybody can live in this city in a safe way. And that extends from rent keeping people in place. Like you said, there is a rent burden where they're spending 30 percent or more of their income. And it also is something as seemingly simple as being able to traverse the city with the Accessoride program, which you took a deep dive into as well. Well, look, here's something that we should start thinking about. Uh, in the year 2022, we calculate that there's going to be 14 million rides, uh, journeys with Accessoride. That's going to be up from six million. Yeah. So I, many people are aware of my audit of Accessoride. It will never shows, make it. Well, it just shows that the system is broken and yeah. that we have to seriously look at the Accessoride program to have better GPS, to have better ways 
to hold uh, to hold that system accountable. We can no longer have you know rides that didn't occur and, and things like that. So that's one area we're looking at. We're mm -hmm. looking at transportation or transportation alternatives. We also have to make sure that we're dealing with rent freezing, whether it's the SCREE program or the DRE program. And there's also how do we build out uh, what a 21st century apartment looks like for people who are aging in place. And that is something that the city should look at. So what did I say in the report? We said, why don't we bring all the agencies together? There's like five or six agencies that deal with senior issues, whether it's Department for the Aging or Department right. of Transportation. Let's start having conversations now to figure out what a 10, 15 year plan would look like for our seniors who really are the backbone of our city. So speaking of that powwow, I could imagine uh, from, the, from the same report on aging, uh, we talked about the Department of Aging, uh, their budget is just 0.4% of the city's total expenditures. So that is literally about $300 per senior. Which, well, that's right, we calculate zero. Which could have been a lot during their heyday, even in their youth, but $300 ain't much. Well, we, we, we don't center on the fact that we're not spending enough money, though I do point it out that perhaps some of the programs that we would want to see put in place, there's certainly room, mm -hmm. given the paltry sum we spend on senior programs and senior services. But the basic basis of this report is not to throw money at a problem. The basis of this report is to think strategically, mm -hmm. to compare what other cities are doing around right. the country, around the world, to make sure that our population is able to live a full life. And by the way, that has real uh, economic ramifications mm -hmm. for millennials and younger people because the more we Cut keep people bill. out of hospitals and doctors' offices, right. uh, the more people can thrive. My own my own mother is 83 years old. She just had her second hip replacement at 83, yeah. and she wanted to have it because she wants to run She's the marathon. Doing She's doing it. <laughs> I was like, Mom, do you really want the second hip replacement? She says, I have to do it because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, she knows that that continues her full life, right. and she doesn't want to compromise that but she has to make sure we have to make sure that seniors uh, all of our mothers or grandmothers are able to go back to that apartment after a surgery right. and make sure the bars and the way the apartments laid out is about making sure that they can be safe even after a voluntary surgery so you spoke about sort of that ripple effect that if we don't take care of seniors can spread across Millennials the baby boomers all of these folks but another ripple effect I'm concerned with is from President Trump. There's been a lot of posturing about New York as a sanctuary city and what he's going to do with budgets. So you're the guy who's watching our numbers. How afraid should we be of retribution based on our moral stance? Well, you know, uh, Cranes New York said that I was one of the elected officials most focused on the Trump presidency because I do have the numbers on how it's impacting New York City residents. Right. And I'm going to continue to talk about this and tell a story. And the bottom line is under the proposed budget, mm -hmm. we could lose up to $440 million. From as NYCHA a city. to NEA NYCHA, to absolutely. healthcare. Absolutely. We should talk about NEA because NEA has funded New York City arts programs about $233 million over the last 16 years, so people will say, well, that's not a huge amount of money. Yeah. And I say, wait, 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 hold on for a second. Uh, an NEA grant, big or small, is so critical for the 65% of small arts organizations that get NEA grants in New York City, because when you have that NEA grant, it's a stamp of approval. That means right. you can go to bigger funders and say, I'm NEA approved, it's okay, give me money. We want to apply, and that helps. And that's something that we don't want to lose. That imprimatur is so critical for community-based funding. Mm -hmm. So we want to be able to talk about that. And we also want to talk about the bigger questions. What's going to happen to public housing, yeah. Section 8 housing? How are we going to feed the homeless and take care of our people if the federal so, government is cutting us off? Sorry, looking at the, the whole landscape then of all of these possible cuts, where do you think the most dire need for our attention, our voices, our advocacy is looking at that entire landscape of what could be cut from the funding? Well, I, th I think, look, uh, if you're an arts organization, you care about NEA. But if you're a homeless organization, you obviously care about homeless funding. So I'm not going to cherry pick which one is more important. Let's assume our city, in my view, is critical to the world and to the world economy. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to be the whipping, uh, being whipped by the Republicans and Trump in Washington for political reasons. But I will tell you, almost every weekend as I travel this borough, whether it's Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, Staten Island, or the Bronx, yeah. the demonstrations, the activism, people saying, 
we're not going to take it. Mm -hmm. That's how we were able to stop the repeal of uh, the Affordable Care Act. And that is why we're going to have the loudest voices we have ever seen since the 60s and the 70s. We want to protect our immigrants. We want to protect the United States of America. Yeah. And we sure want to protect this city. And look, at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with our country that one good election can cure, but we're not having that election right now. Yeah. And that's why we're out in the streets. And that's why we're releasing data to inform the public, because people have a right to know what is happening with the federal government and as it relates to the future of our city, which is on my watch. Okay, I'm completely out of time there wrapping me, but you mentioned we're not having that election, but we are having an election in New York City. There's a long list of folks who've thrown their hat in for the mayorship. I wondered if you are ready to endorse anyone just yet. Well, right now I'm just focused and starting to think about that I have to run for re-election as controller, but I'm sure as time goes on I'll be supporting a whole host of candidates for mayor and otherwise. So stay tuned. A host of candidates? Well, there's did. people running for all kinds of offices, okay. and I like to get involved. So stay tuned. We may announce something on, on, uh, on, on Brooklyn NY. You never know, you know? All right. We'll be watching. See you at the town hall. All right, Comptroller Stringer. Once again, that town hall is tomorrow night in Flatbush. Come out and have your voice heard. You get an advocate on your side. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in uh, Flatbush.